we begin our study, a new study in the book of a Bible, uh, the epistle of the second John, as we're going to go into an in-depth study, uh, verse by verse, word by word, we're going to cover every aspect, we're going to treat this study as if you were a newborn babe in Christ. Some of you are not newborn babes, you're grown, and it's helped to know and to learn, to relearn what you've already known. Bring back into memory maybe what you lost, maybe something, a subject that you totally forgot about, or maybe you're going to learn something new about the subject. The Epistle of the Second John, start out an introduction was written between 80 to 85 AD, but there is no fixed time period. I mean, there was no date written with this letter, as if you were to write a letter to a family member or to an organization, you would put, you know, your name and the date. There was no date attached to the letter. Uh, the date would correspond with, as a fact, we looked at who the writer is. I mean, certainly this letter was not written before uh, the guy was born, and certainly wasn't written after the guy was born. It was penned by him. The writer is supposed to be St. John the Apostle. By means of the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, first and third John, by its writing style, and we'll look into that a little bit further, the book has one chapter. The epistle has one chapter. It's a book. It has 13 verses. And 298 words. Now that has been confirmed by me. And I have in my, in my lesson here, I have a chart. Which I might be able to download to... Uh, sermon net or I might bill if you would like to have a copy of it I might bill send it to your email but it has been confirmed by me uh, three times I've counted it and where I made a mistake I went back and recounted three confirmed times have I confirmed that there are 298 words with 298 words that are in the epistle of second John let me give you more information here the word the is the most used 20 times followed by the word and ranks number two 14 times followed by number three that which is ranked up with 12 times and the word not ranked four at nine times in the thing. In other words, of interest would probably be, let's see, let me go through. Christ is mentioned four times in this epistle. Father is mentioned four times. God is mentioned four times. Love is mentioned four times. Children mentioned three times. Commandment mentioned three times. Doctrine matches three times. Uh, just look at elect shows up twice. Jesus shows up twice. Just look at other words here. Antichrist shows up once. Deceiver and deceivers shows up once, but that's a big, big subject. So there are 298 total words. This study has been done by me. It's a research paper I've done for uh, Charity Baptist Institute. This is for my Captain of Theology Diploma, which I scored 100 A-plus on. So I'm going ahead, and after it's been graded, and after all the checks have been done, it's been approved by my instructor, I am now going to give you this lesson. you got to bear with me, because when I had this done by... A company printed up for some whatever reason when I downloaded 
spaces were removed and you've got two maybe up to eight words that had to combine into one so I may have to try to read break down and add the spaces to it it wasn't identified to after all the work was done so I apologize with that if that were to cause any problems as we study so again there's one chapter there's 13 verses and 298 words paragraphs are found in verse 1 5 7 and 10 paragraphs are verses 1 5 7 and 10 and that's how we're going to break down as a central theme we're going to break down the to the paragraphs but we're going to get into individual word studies we are going to really really settle down we're not going to you know rush through this study we're going to study and show ourselves approved unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed but rightly dividing the word of truth you're going to learn the basic fundamentals again of Christianity and this may be the first time all right We've said that it is supposed that St. John the Apostle is the writer. Now, nowhere does it say in the epistle that John wrote it. Nowhere. He does not ascribe his name. But we're going to look at the external evidence of John. We find the proofs for the external, excuse me, we find the proofs of the evidence from the church fathers. The church follows by a timeline. Their life coincided with the life and death of the apostle follows. The apostles' lives parallel that of the Lord Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. As you know, the apostles, which were the twelve disciples, they lived with Jesus Christ for three, three and a half years. Their life paralleled the life of Jesus Christ and overlapped past his death, burial, and resurrection. And we read about their lives even after Jesus was went to heaven in Acts chapter 1. The apostles are still living and are still active in the ministry of the church now on their own as now Jesus is going to heaven. So you have Jesus, you have the apostles living with Jesus and living beyond Jesus' earthly, earthly uh, life. Now, the church fathers, like the apostles, lived during the time of the apostles and overlap their deaths. So as the apostles are the testimony of Jesus and the, and the witness of Jesus, as you read Acts chapter 1 when, Ruth, when Luke writes, and you read Luke chapter 1, they, they bared record, record and recorded in 1 John is the record that they walked and talked and lived with Jesus. The church fathers walked and talked and corresponded with the apostles. The apostles' lives parallel that of the Lord Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection. We have the genuine witness account of the men that lived during the period of the time of the apostles and that of, of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ passed on, on to the apostles, and the apostles passed on to the church fathers. First hand revel, revelation, Luke wrote, and we're going to do a lot of quoting the scriptures. I want you to know this is not me, but this is the Bible. I will tell you where I, I stand in. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. John wrote, This is the disciple which testified of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. These are the men that lived and walked with Jesus. These are the men that, that God passed on to the responsibility of the growth and the actions after Jesus has gone to heaven. And, John wrote, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. From the apostles, we have the solid evidence. 
which would hold up in any suitable courtroom of the life, death, and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They walked, talked, and lived with him. The apostles passed on to the apostle fathers, which in time was passed on to us. Now the word says in Deuteronomy 17.6, At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses. And that's Deuteronomy 17.6. It's backed up in Deuteronomy 19.15, Matthew 18.16, 2 Corinthians 13.1, 1 Timothy 5.19, and Hebrews 10.18. God declares by witnesses. And let me say, it's not the Jehovah Witnesses. Where it leaves no matter of doubt. God does nothing in secret. God lays it all out. God makes sure that what he says and what happens is laid out. That it can be a sure thing. And that is where your hope and your faith rests. In that God is not a liar but true. The witness we have of Second John are the men that knew, lived with, and corresponded with John. They tell us by living with John, by knowing John, that this epistle was written by John. A rough draft of the drawing timeline of Jesus and apostles and church fathers. Like I said, you got from Jesus' ministry... To his death, burial, and resurrection, and it up to heaven. Right here, in the middle, the apostles, their lives and death. And they stretch beyond the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And in the middle here, you got the church fathers that lived with the apostles. And they stretch their lives past the death of the apostles. And then there were people who lived with the church fathers. And so on and so on and so on. I don't know, maybe I can get this to show. I don't know. We'll try and see what happens. You see that little basic chart there? Okay. Well, to help each overlay is a witness to the former's life, Jesus or the apostles' testimony. It was assumed about Jesus being a son about 30 years old when he went into his public ministry, that when he called the, the disciples out. At that point, it's where it was where the, the disciples began living. And being part of Jesus' life. And that continued to, to three and a half years until his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, at some point of the, the apostles' lives, there were men that came in their lives, the church fathers, and they lived and had beings with apostles and passed their lives and gave us the testimony of the apostles like the apostles gave us the testimony of Jesus Christ. Some of the church fathers are Polycarp, P-O-L-Y-C-A-R-P, Tartilium, T-A-R-T-U-L-L-I-A-N, and Irenaeus, I-R-E-N-A-E-N-U-S. It would be interesting to study some of these men. One essential note, church fathers are in no relation to that the church the Roman Catholic Papal Fathers. I don't call that a church, the Roman Catholic. It's an institution. And they ought to be locked up. And they're going to be locked up. That of the church in hell. The priest and all that. You know where you call the guy who wears his suit on backwards. You're supposed to call him father. 
But the Bible says, call no man your father. And they'll alibi around that so they can get, you know, the proper titles and all that. They were not priests of the corrupt popal, Pope Institute of the Roman Catholic. Now, I'm not picking on the Roman Catholic individuals. Let's get this straight right now and here. I believe there are Roman Catholics are saved. I believe Roman Catholics can be saved. When I say the Roman Catholic Papal Institute, however I say it, I'm talking about the organization of the corruptness of the body, the main body of the priests and the elders and the nuns and all that that know perfectly well they're doing wrong. Most of my family were Roman Catholic. Some were saved. Others I, I call very much doubt. And that Roman Catholic, Catholic Institute leaves that doubt where scriptures say you may you can know you can have eternal life. They were just fathers in sense, the, the church fathers. I presume that they helped birth the church, even though Jesus Christ is the foundation, that the apostles went out and told people about Jesus and witnessed and started churches that these church fathers helped them with the word and helped them in getting settled. They did not labor as the Roman Catholic Institute fathers in sins, wickedness or rebellion against the word. And the Roman Catholic Institute is rebelling against the word and that's a whole nother story. There are several books and tracts you can get out. Again, I say institute because I don't call that organization a church. The internal evidence that John. The Apostle John's writing style, sentiment, and manner. The manner is John does not attach his name as Paul attaches his name. James and Peter attaches their names to their epistles and their writings. There is one exception, though, of John, the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd epistles of John, and he's the writer of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, falsely called the Revelation of St. John Divine. Read the first chapter, verse 1. It says of Jesus Christ, his severe, harsh remarks and character. Look at 3 John 10. Wherefore, I, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbid them that would and forbid them that would, and casts them out of the church. Well, I mean, he's harsh. He's not saying that, you know, sucking his thumb. He's not saying that, you know, with a wet diaper. He's stating the fact, and he names. For those who are out there, you don't name names. Well, Paul names names and puts the title to the character. John is not a sissy preacher. Let's look at another one. Let's look at Mark chapter 3, verse 7. Mark chapter 3, verse 7. Getting to know who, who John is before we get to the book. Introduction. Mark chapter 3, verse 7, I said. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude followed Gal multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea. Now down to verse number. All right. Oh, that's a scribal. Mark three seven.
That's a scribal error there. Let me cross that. I don't know what that has to do with anything. Sorry about that. Mark chapter 938. Man makes mistakes. And John answered, saying, Mark 938. Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he follows not us, and we forbade him, because he followed not us. Listen, John, here's a guy, he's, he's preaching in the name of Jesus, casting out devils. John walks up to him and says, listen, knock it off. Get out of here. Follow us and do right. But Jesus said, forbid him not, for there is no man which does a miracle in my name. That can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. John rebukes him. I mean, yeah, John rebukes him. I thought I said Mark. John wants people to follow Jesus. John wants them to do things the proper way. And when we read back then in 3 John 10, here, here's a guy who's not doing it right. He wants to be the big honcho. He wants to be the boss in charge of everything. And John writes a letter saying, listen, I rebuke you. And when I come, when I come in that area, I'm going to rebuke you to your face. John is not afraid to stand up for Christ. And you see that in the Gospel of John. You see that in the Revelation. You see that in the life of John. In the, in the three epistles that he writes. And in Luke 9, 54. Luke 9, 54. We'll start in verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they went, and entered into the village of the Samaritans, to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw, that, saw this, they said, Lord, Will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? John's point of view right now in James is, listen, you ain't going to follow Jesus. You ain't going to do what Jesus tells you to do. Burn. <laughs> that gives a new remark to turn and burn. They didn't turn, so boom, throw fire down upon them, Lord. Just like Elias did. It shows you another thing, too, that John knew Jewish history. John is no dummy. He is no fool. And he has a zeal for the Lord Jesus Christ that you are to follow him. And if you don't, he'll walk up in your face and say, do it. Or shut up. Even I don't have that zeal. I got it in the back of my head I like to do that. But because of the Constitution of America, they have a right to sh not shut up with all the stupidity that comes out of their mouth. And if I were to do what the Bible an example as John does, they would have me arrested and put in jail for telling the truth. I think the scriptures say, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I may misquote that verse. But I got the sense of it. You're not going to find a preacher like John today. If you do, they are rare. A dime a dozen. If not, you know, two dollars a dozen. And no one wants to pay the price. Because the Bible says, Paul writes, that there, today there are people that want itchy ears. They want to feel good. Well, John was not like that. And the severe, hard, hard, harsh remarks and character follow the writings. In this book that we're going to study, 
John takes that gospel hammer and he takes the nail of the deceivers and he nails it right into the wood. He tells it as it is in truth and tells you what to do about it and leaves no ifs, ands, or buts. John leaves it is you're going to walk the right way or you're going to walk the wrong way. John is the one that wrote Revelation chapter 3. And let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Let's discuss our church age before we get into this study in this church age. Let's see how much this church is a liar before we get in this study. For it says, and John wrote this, I'll read you John, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. John wrote this from the angel, which was a testify from Jesus Christ. This is the seventh church age. This is our church age before the rapture. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and anything but what this church age is. And if I could, I would. I'd give you names of churches. I'd give you names of people. And I'd give you what the churches are doing. But I'll give you a little, a little assignment to do. Just go down a road where churches are and just read their front signs. The bazaars, the flea markets, the get the mulch for missionaries, and these vacation Bible junk that they're having today. And these nice little cute little sayings. And they never mind stepping in the pulpit and wishy watchy preacher that's behind there. And then probably even still preacherettes that are defiling the, the Word of God. The beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. God knows what you're doing. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that were cold or hot. Imagine God saying, if you're going to be a Christian, be a cold Christian or be a hot Christian. God's saying, listen, if you want to be a cold Christian, go for it. You're going to lose rewards, but go for it. If you're going to be a hot Christian, you're going to get rewards. You're going to be pleased. God's going to be pleased with you. But look at this. So thou, because thou art lukewarm. There are Christians that walk down the middle of the road. They're not cold and not hot. They're kissing Satan and they're kissing Jesus. That's adultery. That's fornication. That's defiling the God that died for your sins. Acts 20:28. 20, when you hold hands with Satan. That's the church age we are in. That John wrote. John wrote exactly what the angel, which is exactly from the, from the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember the two or three witnesses? God, Jesus Christ, the angel, and John. That's four witnesses. So that because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You Christians that walk the middle of the line of the road, you make God sick. And you make me sick when I try to witness to people and they use you as the excuse. And or your church. 
Well, I know a Christian. I know a pastor. Well, that church down there. Yeah, I've heard all the excuses that people use with your name attached to it. And they do give names, by the way. You may fool yourself, but you don't fool God, you don't fool Satan, and you don't fool the world. Because thou sayest, this is what the church is saying today, I am rich. Multi-million dollar churches are being built with multi-million dollar signs and fancy theatrical pews and... Uh, Forget the uh, the hymnals. We'll have this screen come down. We'll follow the pretty bouncing ball. And we'll get up there with the glass pulpit. And we get up there with our fancy new Bibles and our fancy robes and all that other junk. We are rich, John wrote. And increase with goods. Good for nothing. We got pews, we've got the the pianos, we've got all the sound systems, we got the AC, we've got the heating, we've got the uh, bowling club, we got the men's club, we got the women's club, we got the things for the kiddies, and yet, but you're broken. Your families are, are, are gone. Satan is in the pew in the front row. Amen to the preacher while Jesus is standing outside knocking on the door for anybody to come out. We'll get to that. And have need of nothing. We don't need God. We got a bank account. We got good people that give money in the plate. We've got uh, mortgages. We got credit cards. We've got all kinds of people. We've got 5,000 people just got saved in a town of a thousand. We got all these baptisms. We support all these missionaries. And we got everything. One thing you ain't got, you ain't got God. I've been in some of those churches. We're not done. And knowest not, this is God speaking, you do not know that thou art wretched. Wow. Distress, grief, affliction, deeply. You don't even know that you are in affliction, you are diseased, and you are making God sick. You think you're doing God's will, and God's up in heaven going, Ugh! Give me a barf bag. I don't like how you preach. Uh, no wonder. I'm preaching the truth. I'm preaching what the apostles preach. In your face. Spell it like it is. S-I-N. Some of you Christians probably never even heard that word. Never mind if I mention the word hell. But we're not done. And miserable. Oh, we're good. We got the clouds. We got the parades. We got everything. Wait till you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and see what you're going to be like. You and your pony rides and all the movies and whatever you got. Some of you out there, that you're laughing because you know what? Your church is not like this, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you know I'm angering those people, and they probably already turned this off. If I was telling let's get on with the lesson. They've already turned it off. They've already had their heart attack, and they're already standing before Jesus already. Well, maybe some of them are, are still listening. Praise God. Maybe somebody's out there, their heart really wants to get right, and they're angry as fire, but you know what they're saying? I think he's right. I've never heard that before. I've never heard preaching like that before. Well, listen, I'm looking for a pulpit. I'm looking for a church. You can contact me. I'll come and preach. I'll be your pastor. I'll be your preacher. I'll be your teacher. I'll give you the truth. But you ain't going to have 100,000 people in the church. You're going to have 100,000 people going to come hear the message and leave. 
For few that will get saved, and many walk the path of destruction. You know, Jesus only had 12 in his entire life that completely followed him. And where were those 12 when he died? Only John was at the cross when Jesus died. We'll read on. And poor. Well, if you look at some of these churches around these towns, especially here in Ormond Beach, you think anything but poor. But that's not, that's not the earthly, worldly thing. That's their account in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. When they just gather up wood, hay, or stubble. And blind. I'm going to tell you right now, I know there are Christians right now I love so dearly. I wish I could say it, but the things that are going on right in front of their eyes, they're blind. They can't even see that a scripture is not even King James Bible. They can't see that the events going on in their life are devilish. has nothing to do with Christianity, but they go into it, stupid little sheep. And naked. You're going to stand before Jesus Christ and every saved, born again Christian, judgment seat of Christ, and you're not going to have the righteousness of the saints. Do you know what righteousness of the saints is? Have you studied your Bible to know that? Do you know what I'm talking about, Christian? Have you read your Bible all the way through? Because if you have, you know what the righteousness of the saints is. Now, I'm not going to tell you, because unless you study the Word of God, you're naked. Why don't you find out what the righteousness of the saints are? And why don't you get busy getting out of this thing right here? You know what this church is? This church is a liar. Because God says, because I, thou sayest the church, I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. I have needs of nothing. And God says, Thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. God just told you, lad, to see in church age, you are a liar. Now you go over to John 8, 44 and read that. You find out who the father of your church is. It may have been good at one day and one in time, but... Now, well, I'm going to jump over for the sake of time. We're not doing Revelation. But this is something that John wrote. This is John's character. He did not syrup coat the message. He did not put diabetes sugar into this message. He put the salt in there. He wrote out of the mouth of Jesus through the angel exactly what God told him to do. And I wonder if you get the perverted Bibles out there if this has been changed. I know it has without even looking. Well, we're going to look at verse 20 now. I'll leave the rest for you to read yourself. Behold, I, Jesus, stand at the door and knock. And you get all kinds of, you know, people, they draw pictures there without the door handle and all that. It doesn't say that. It just says he stands at the door and knock. Do you know that Back then, their doors did not look like our doors. <laughs> Why do we got to bring the Bible up to up to date? We got to bring put Americanism into the Bible. Why does everything we read it has to be something Americanized? This is this is a European area around the area of Turkey. Paul is on an island of Platinus. There's no America. No, Jesus Christ did not go over to America and go to a bunch of Indians with Hebrew names. Followed by the angel Baloni. In the Hebrew, that means baloney. Everything found on the floor, put into one loaf, sliced up, and eaten as a sandwich. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus Christ is standing outside the church. He's knocking on the door for anybody to come answer it. And the church answers, we don't have time for Jesus. We've got our programs. Jesus would not like our music events. Jesus would not like our movies. 
We took the tracks right out of the church. We don't even use them no more because they represent Jesus, and that's not our thing. Jesus wouldn't be comfortable in our pews because our pews are padded and everything else. It probably has coffee holders in them now. Jesus wouldn't improve the bouncing ball as we sing this hymn. Jesus wouldn't improve our pastor. The Lord is love. I love you all out there. You're just all a bunch of wonderful. Jesus Christ is standing outside the church knocking. Let's go see what John has to say. John 8 44. John wrote this. Jesus said it. John wrote it. After what we just read about the church age, let's see what it said. Ye of your father the devil. The lust of your father ye will do. You know lust? You know there's lust going on in church today? You're smooching with Satan. You're romancing with the world. He was a murderer from the beginning. How many souls are going to hell, church, because they think they were saved and you Gave them another plan of salvation. You gave them a false assurance. That they will die without Christ. Thinking they have Christ as their savior. And I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. I ain't talking about false uh, religions. I'm talking about the church that has Baptists on their heading. And you do it all for the sake of, I got 5,000 saved. We had 300 in Sunday school. He was a murderer from the beginning and bold not in the truth. If your church does not have a King James 1611 authorized version of the Bible, it is not the truth. It is a lie written with the brimstone of hell as the ink. When he speaketh a lie, oh, there's plenty of preachers that get up there and speak a lie. He speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's Satan. You know, there's two churches and only two churches out there. I don't care if you're congregationalist. I don't care if you're non-denominational. I don't care if you're a Baptist. I don't care if you're Catholic. There's only two churches there. You're either representing God of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, or you are representing Satan. Okay. John. Internal evidence. He's an elder. John is an apostle that did not decease from a violent death. All the eleven apostles died of a violent death. Either they crucified themselves, they were beheaded, or if you pick up Fox's Book of Martyrs and read, it's within the, the first chapter, if not the first beginning of the book. It will tell you the lives of the twelve apostles and their deaths and where they died an approximate year that they died in. John never suffered a violent death. Even though, i got to look this up. I'm tired of saying I don't know what it is. John was placed into boiling oil or water. i got to find that out. I forget. I don't know which is. John is placed into a boiling vat of liquid and survives it and is placed on the island of Platmus just to die. And the revelation of Jesus Christ is brought to him, and he writes the entire book. Well, I can't serve God because I got pain. Third degree burns over your entire body. You ever read what happened to Paul? All the perils he went through, being stoned. And still he wrote, still he witnessed. Unless you're completely bedridden, you don't have an excuse. 
At least you can do is pray for those who do. While he was placed into a boiling oil and banished to the island of Platinus to pass away, which he wrote again in the book of Revelation, he is the eldest and last of the apostles living. He survives them all. Irenaeus, that was the church father that we read about, ascribes the second epistle to John, calling upon John, the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the church father Irenaeus says and writes in his writings, as he lived through John, he knew John personally, he's heard of John, as John knew Jesus Christ personally, Irenaeus ascribes this epistle to John, even though John does not ascribe his name to it. Like I said, Paul, James, and Peter do, but John doesn't. We're going to stop right there. We really got really good far. I know it's not good English. A lot better speaking Spanish. We're going to get into next week, Lord willing, John the Apostle. We're going to look at much scripture about him. We got to build the foundation. We got to know who John the writer is. And we saw his character. And then we'll get into the outline. But let's review what we have. His manner, internal evidence, is that he does not ascribe his names to his books. Exception, the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. He has harsh remarks. And some of you out there are saying, you do too. Well, amen. He's an elder. The church fathers, Irenaeus, said that he wrote... We also look at the external evidence that the church fathers overlap, paralyzed the lot, par paralyzed, par not paralyzed, parallel the lives of the apostles, as the apostles' lives paralleled with Jesus Christ's life. Luke and John write that they were eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that God declares and announces and fortifies and seals by the mouth of two or three witnesses. We looked at there's one chapter, there's 13 verses, and there's 298 words. That this book was written between 80 and 85 AD, and we'll get more into dates and, and John later. But well, that's the introduction, more introduction to follow uh, before we get into the actual book. And one more, like I said, we're, we're going to do, we're going to stop at words. And we're going to park for a while. And we're going to study certain words all the way. I wrote this commentary myself. With the newborn babe in Christ in mind. To help him to begin the growth. I wrote this as milk for the babe. As a refresher. As a remembrance to those that are skilled. That you may know the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may know his words. I'm going to get harsh. I'm going to get loud, and I'm going to get angry, and I'm going to get tender. Because I want you to know the truth. I will slam those who do not tell the truth. I will tell you about those that don't tell the truth. Because I don't want you to fall prey to the devil and Satan. I don't want you to fall prey to his people. If you are to read 2 Corinthians 11, you are to realize that Satan has pulpits. Just because a guy gets up in the pulpit and says, Thus saith the Lord, or let us pray in Jesus' name, doesn't mean that they're God's men. Read the Old Testament. Jezebel had her own preachers. 
Those preachers of Satan come a dime a dozen. Continue next week. I hope you follow along. I hope this, this lesson is valuable to you. That you will use it. You are free to give this out to anybody. You are free to put this out. As long as you don't change it, as long as you don't retake, make me say something I didn't say, because I won't say I said it. And God is your witness. I ask that this be a blessing to you in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen.